Ever feel like you're stuck in that, uh, that never ending cycle of putting out fires at work? You know what I mean? Like constantly scrambling because of skill gaps, confusion, missed deadlines, all because, well, training feels like an afterthought. Oh, I've been there. It's yeah. like you could never quite get ahead of the curve. Exactly. But what if we could trade those fire extinguishers for, I don't know, blueprints yeah. like what if instead of always reacting to those fires we could actually prevent them now that sounds like a breath of fresh air sign me up well get ready because that's exactly what we're diving into today we're tackling this paper from way back 1984 called developing performance-based curriculum architecture using a group process don't worry it's not as dry as it sounds 1984 that's what almost 40 years ago yeah things have changed a bit since then you, okay you'd think so right but that's the thing. This paper, which was actually presented at a conference, outlines this surprisingly relevant approach to training design. We're talking about anticipating those fires and building a structure to prevent them instead of always playing catch up. So it's less about putting out fires and more about designing a fireproof building in the first place. You got it. And it all starts with a solid foundation, which is exactly what this paper provides. They lay out a clear four-step process, and step one is all about defining the scope. Basically, what are we building and who are we building it for? Makes sense. You have to know what you're aiming for before you start laying bricks. Right. Are we talking about a program for the entire company, a single department, or maybe even just a specific job role? And then, equally important, who are we training? New hires, seasoned pros, or a mix of everyone? Because a one-size-fits-all approach rarely fits anyone perfectly. Exactly. It's about tailoring that program to the unique needs and challenges of the people we're trying to reach. Like choosing the right tool from the toolbox, you wouldn't use a wrench to hammer in a nail. Perfect analogy. Now, step two is where things get really interesting. Instead of just the training department shouldering all the responsibility, this method advocates for assembling a diverse team of stakeholders, and they call this team the Curriculum Project Committee. So, a team effort, more minds working together. I like the sound of that. Who are these stakeholders? Well, and this is the really fascinating part. They want managers to spearhead this committee, not just someone from HR pushing papers, but the people who are actually overseeing day-to-day -day operations. Now, that's interesting, bringing managers to the table from the get-go. Mm. Why is that so crucial? Well, the thinking is that by involving managers early on, you're making sure that the training actually aligns with the goals and priorities of their departments. Ah, so it's about getting buy-in from the start. Instead of roadblocks later, it's paving the road to success together. Exactly. It's like everyone agreeing on what's for dinner before you even start cooking. That way, you know, everyone will actually be excited about the meal. Makes sense. So managers are key players on this committee. Who else is invited to this brainstorming party? Well, the paper also stresses how important it is to have two other groups as part of the process. First, you have what they call the expert group. Mm -hmm. These are the seasoned veterans, the folks who are already rocking it in their roles. They bring that essential on the ground experience to the table. So they've been through the trenches. They know where the potential fires might ignite. Exactly. But here's the twist. They also want to include a new hire group. Wait, really? The folks who are still finding their fitting. Why is that? It might seem counterintuitive, but think about it. New hires offer a fresh perspective. They're still learning the ropes, so they can often pinpoint those areas where the existing training falls short or maybe where assumptions are being made about prior knowledge. Ah, I see. It's like having a fresh set of eyes. Sometimes when you've been staring at something for too long, you miss the obvious flaws, the things that someone new would pick up on right away. Exactly. You'd be amazed at how much wisdom can come from people who are new to the game. I bet. So we've assembled our dream team, a mix of managers, seasoned pros, and newbies, all ready to build this fireproof training program. What's next? Well, now comes the really crucial part, step three, modeling and analyzing performance. And the paper provides a pretty cool tool for this. It's called the performance model. A performance model. What is that exactly? Essentially, it's a way to really understand what successful performance actually looks like in practice. And we do this before we even start sketching out the training materials. So instead of just saying, we need to be better at sales, it's more about breaking down what better actually means in this context. You got it. Instead of just assuming we know what good performance looks like, we analyze it in detail. And how do we do that? Where do we even begin? Well, the performance model helps guide that process. It encourages you to ask those critical questions and gather data to really understand what's happening on the ground. Okay, so we're digging deep, analyzing what's working, what's not working, and why. 
This is starting to sound like a detective story. It kind of is. And just like detectives, we're looking for clues. For those root causes, we're not just looking at what goes wrong, but trying to understand why it goes wrong. That makes sense, because sometimes the solution isn't just more training, right? It might be addressing some underlying issue. Bingo. That's the real aha moment here. Sometimes the problem isn't a lack of knowledge or skills, but maybe it's unclear processes, inadequate tools, or even something else entirely. So not every performance gap can be fixed with just another training course. Exactly. We have to dig deeper. I'm really starting to see the value in this approach. Yeah. It's so much more thoughtful than just throwing training at a problem and hoping it sticks. Right. We've defined our scope, brought together our A-team, and we've analyzed what good and not so good performance actually looks like. So are we ready to start building our training program now? Welcome back to the deep dive. We're back, folks, still on that mission to build a training program that's less about putting out fires and more about, well, preventing them in the first place. I'm still feeling fired up about that idea. Me too. <laughs> and, you know, before the break, we were talking about those first three steps, you know, ditching that reactive mindset, embracing proactive design. Oh, yeah. And assembling that dream team of stakeholders. Right. That mix of managers, experienced folks and even the newbies. Such a brilliant approach. It really is. And, you know, it struck me that it's not just about having all those voices in the room. It's about harnessing that collective energy, making sure it's actually productive. Absolutely. Which brings us to step four, the final piece of this fireproof training program puzzle, building the curriculum architecture. And let me tell you, this isn't about just throwing together some random courses and calling it a day. It's about intentionality, yeah. right? Creating a truly structured learning experience. You got it. And the paper actually lays out a really cool analogy here. They compare this whole process to constructing a building. But instead of bricks and mortar, we're talking about knowledge and skills as our building blocks. I like that. So what does that blueprint for building knowledge look like? Well, they propose a four-level structure. And at the very base, the foundation, we have what they call knowledge slash skill modules. Okay, so the essentials, the must-haves for anyone starting out. Exactly. Things like, you know, understanding the industry lingo, knowing how to use certain software, navigating those sometimes confusing company policies, all that good stuff. Right. Got to have that strong foundation. So what comes after we lay that groundwork? Then we move up to what they call task modules. Think of these as those practical step-by-step -step guides on how to actually perform specific job tasks. Ah, so if the foundation modules are about understanding the tools, these are about using those tools to get things done. Precisely. So let's say our foundation module was about understanding, I don't know, the company's customer relationship management, CRM system. Great. Got it. CRM it is. So the task module would then be about, you know, using that CRM to actually qualify leads or to log customer interactions, that kind of thing. Ah, so we're taking that theoretical knowledge and putting it into practice. Love it. But where do we go from there? All right, so we've laid the foundation, mastered the individual tasks. Now it's time to level up again to what the paper calls task overview modules. And this is where we start connecting the dots, helping people see how all those individual tasks actually connect to the bigger picture. So instead of just knowing how to do something, it's understanding why it matters. Exactly. It's one thing to know you know, how to write a sales report. It's a whole other thing to understand how that report actually plays a role in the company's, you know, strategic decision making. It's about seeing the forest for the trees. I like that. So we've gone from those individual tasks to seeing the big picture. What's left? What's at the tippy top of this knowledge building? OK, so at the very top, we have our orientation modules. And this is all about, like, setting the stage from day one, you know, introducing the company culture, the values, the expectations. Setting the tone right from the start. I like it. Exactly. It's like rolling out the welcome mat, giving everyone that big picture overview of what it really means to be part of this organization. It's like you're saying, welcome. This is who we are. This is what we're about. Exactly. And the cool thing is that this four level structure it not only provides a roadmap for the learner, but it also gives the trainers, the facilitators, a really clear framework to work with. It's systematic, logical, and it ensures that, you know, each piece of training actually has a purpose. It's all connected to that real world performance we keep talking about. A hundred percent. But, you know, as with any good recipe, it's not just about following the steps. It's about understanding the nuances, those little things that can make or break the final product. Oh, absolutely. And with training, one of those crucial ingredients is the human element. 
Because anytime you bring people together, you're inevitably going to have, well, opinions. Oh, yeah. And sometimes those opinions can lead to some, shall we say, spirited debates. <laughs> right. And even with the best of intentions, it's easy for things to go a little sideways when you have a diverse group of people, all with their own perspectives and experiences. Exactly. So how do we make sure that those disagreements, those in inevitable clashes of ideas are actually productive instead of destructive? How do we keep things from going off the rails? That's a great question. And this is where a skilled facilitator can really make all the difference because they can help keep everyone focused on that shared goal of designing a training that really works. So the facilitator is like the referee, making sure everyone plays fair and stays within the lines. I think that's a good analogy. They're there to maintain order, yes, but also to help people communicate effectively. Because sometimes just having someone there to help reframe a question or clarify a point can make a world of difference. And they can also help ensure that everyone feels heard and respected, even when there are differences of opinion. It's about creating that safe space where people feel comfortable sharing their ideas, even if they're a little outside the box. Absolutely. And you know, the, another thing that can really help prevent those fires from erupting is having a clear set of ground rules from the get-go. Oh, ground rules. I like that. So, like, what are we allowed to talk about? How are we going to talk about it? That kind of thing. Exactly. For starters, it's crucial that everyone understands and agrees on the overall goal here, which is designing a training that boosts performance. It's not just checking a box. And maybe some guidelines on how to have those sometimes tough conversations respectfully, right? Because things can get a little heated when we're passionate about something. 100%. Having those communication ground rules is key. And, you know, when disagreements inevitably arise, which they will, having a clear decision-making process in place can also prevent things from going off the rails. So, like, do we do a quick vote, brainstorm solutions as a group, or maybe just take a break to cool down before things escalate? Exactly. Having those procedures spelled out in advance, it's like having a fire escape route planned before you even smell smoke. You hope you never have to use it, but it's there if you need it. I love that analogy. So we've got our facilitator, our ground rules, and our decision-making processes in place. Anything else we need to watch out for? Well, beyond those interpersonal dynamics, yeah. you know, the people part of this whole equation, the paper also highlights some other potential pitfalls we should be aware of. Things that can trip us up even with the best of intentions. Okay, like what, what kinds of obstacles are we talking about here? Well, one common one is something called scope creep. Scope creep, that sounds a little ominous. It is what it sounds like. It's that thing that happens when, you know, the project scope starts to, well, creep beyond those initial boundaries that yeah. we so carefully set. So, like, we start out thinking we're just going to, I don't know, create a training program for new salespeople. Hmm. And then suddenly we're redesigning the entire onboarding process for the whole company. It's easy to get carried away, especially when you're passionate about making things better. So how do we prevent that runaway train of enthusiasm? I think it goes back to having a laser sharp definition of what's in scope and what's out of scope for this particular project. And then when those really exciting but maybe tangential ideas inevitably pop up, we can acknowledge them, appreciate them, but gently steer things back on course. Stay focused, right? Don't lose sight of the original mission. Exactly. Now, another potential pitfall is what's known as analysis paralysis. Have you ever experienced that? Analysis paralysis. Is that where you spend so much time thinking about something that you never actually do anything about it? You nailed it. It's when we get so bogged down in analyzing the performance, dissecting every tiny little detail, that we never actually get around to designing the training itself. We're so busy studying the fire hazard that we forget to actually build the fire extinguisher. Exactly. It's like sure. reading every single book about swimming, but never actually getting in the water. So what's the antidote to analysis paralysis? How do we break free from that endless cycle of planning? It's a balancing act, really. We have to strike that balance between, you know, doing our due diligence, analyzing things thoroughly, and then actually taking action. It's helpful to set some realistic timelines and to remind ourselves that sometimes done is better than perfect. We can always fine tune things as we go. Progress over perfection. I like that. So scope creep, analysis paralysis, what else? Well, and th this might seem obvious, but I think it's worth emphasizing. Don't forget the human element. It's easy to get so caught up in the logistics, you know, ticking off those boxes that we forget to actually, you know, celebrate the wins, to share a laugh, to build those connections with our fellow team members. Oh, that's so important. It's amazing how a little camaraderie, you know, that sense of shared purpose can really fuel that creative fire, wouldn't you say? hundred percent. When people feel good, 
when they feel connected to each other and to the mission, amazing things can happen. And that positive energy, it can make all the difference in transforming a group of individuals into a truly high-performing team. Welcome back to the deep dive. We're putting those final touches, you know, adding those finishing details to our exploration of how to build a training program that really lights a fire, not one that just fizzles out like a dud. We're talking about igniting performance, not starting dumpster fires of confusion. Exactly. And, you know, we've covered a lot of ground. We talked about ditching that reactive firefighting mode, embracing a more proactive approach to design. We assembled our dream team of stakeholders. We talked about navigating those potential pitfalls of collaboration. Phew, it's been quite a journey. And all of it leading to this taking all those amazing insights and actually turning them into a training program that really delivers. And that's where things get really exciting because we're moving beyond those theories, beyond the blueprints. We're talking about building something tangible, something real. From analysis to action. Love it. So where do we even begin? I mean, we've analyzed performance, right? We've created this structured curriculum architecture. We've talked about fostering a collaborative spirit. But how do we actually translate all that into real world training? You know, materials, experiences, all that good stuff. Well, that's where creativity meets practicality, I think. And the beauty of it is that there's no one right way to do it. It's not a cookie cutter approach. Yeah. The most effective training programs, they're like those tailored suits, custom fit to the unique needs and preferences of the learners and the organization itself. So flexibility and adaptability are key here. We've got to be able to adjust on the fly. Absolutely. One size fits all simply doesn't cut it in the world of training. Okay. I like that. So no cookie cutters. We're tailoring instead. But what kind of fabrics are we even considering here? What are some of those elements that make for a really effective training experience? Well, one principle that stood the test of time is active learning. Because, you know, it's not enough to just shower people with information, mm -hmm. hoping some of it sticks. We got to get them engaged, get those hands dirty, let them wrestle with the material, make it their own. So ditch those boring, sleep-inducing lectures, right? Please, anything but that. And instead, we're talking about what, interactive exercises, simulations, maybe some good old-fashioned group discussions, things that get those brain juices flowing. Exactly. We're talking about creating an experience, something memorable. Think about it this way. What are you more likely to remember passively listening to someone drone on and on about how to, I don't know, bake a cake? Yeah. Or... I don't sleep rolling up your sleeves, getting your hands dirty, maybe even having a little taste of the batter along the way. Exactly. You're going to learn a lot more from that hands-on experience, even if it means, you know, maybe ending up with a little flower on your face. A little flower never hurt anyone. Okay, so active learning check. But then there are the logistics, right? How are we actually delivering this amazing training? Do we go with in-person workshops, online modules, or maybe some kind of a hybrid approach? What are we thinking? You know, it really all boils down to finding the right fit for the situation. And remember those practical considerations we talked about earlier. Things like, you know, how many trainees are there? Where are they located? What kind of learning styles do they prefer? What's the budget? All those factors play a role in figuring out the best approach. So if we're working with a global team, maybe with limited time and resources, you know, online learning might be the most practical option. It could be, for sure. It's about <laughs> weighing those pros and cons. But then if we're focused on, say, developing leadership skills or maybe we want to foster some team dynamics, well, you can't beat that face-to-face -face interaction, right? You hit the nail on the head. Sometimes you just can't replace that in-person energy. But regardless of whether we go virtual, in-person, or some combination of the two, there's this one ingredient that can really make or break a training program, and that's ongoing support and reinforcement. Yes, because let's be honest, we've all been there. We sit through a training, maybe we're feeling super energized, inspired in the moment, but then we go back to the daily grind, and poof, it's like it never even happened. It's the dreaded forgetting curve. We learn something new, but if we don't use it, we lose it. Exactly. It's like that saying, use it or lose it. So how do we help people hold on to those new skills, make them stick? That's where those ongoing support mechanisms come in. We need to think beyond that initial training event itself, provide learners with resources and support to help them really integrate what they've learned into their day-to-day -day work. So things like job aids, coaching guides, maybe even like some online communities of practice, those things that provide that continuous learning loop, right? Ensure those skills become second nature. And now you're talking. And you know, one often overlooked element here is the power of celebration. 
recognizing and rewarding those small wins along the way. Because everyone loves a little pat on the back, right? Exactly. A little positive reinforcement goes a long way. It's like that feeling you get when you finally, I don't know, nail that difficult guitar riff you've been working on or when you conquer a challenging recipe. Celebrating those milestones makes that learning process so much more rewarding. And more fun. Absolutely. Learning should be enjoyable. Okay, so we're nearing the finish line of our training design adventure. We've covered a lot. But there's one final crucial step we can't overlook, and that, my friend, is evaluation. Evaluation? Wait, but we poured our heart and soul into this program. Shouldn't it be amazing? Don't we pass with flying colors automatically? Oh, of course it's going to be fantastic. But even the most amazing programs, they can benefit from a little fine-tuning, a little tweaking here and there. So how do we evaluate, you know, objectively, whether this training is actually hitting the mark? What are we looking for? We're on the hunt for evidence, hard data that tells us, yes, this program is actually moving the needle on those key performance indicators we were so careful to define way back at the beginning. So are those metaphorical fires we've been talking about actually being extinguished? That's the million dollar question. Are we seeing real tangible results, improvements in productivity, communication, whatever those specific goals were, we got to measure that. And how do we gather this intel? Well, those insights, they can come from a lot of different places. Of course, we want to hear from the participants themselves, what worked for them, what didn't. We can also look at manager observations, performance data, even things like customer satisfaction surveys. It's about taking that holistic view, understanding how this training is impacting the organization as a whole. We're talking about looking at those ripple effects. And then we can use all that valuable information to refine, to improve the program over time. 100%. It's a journey, not a destination. Because the world of work is constantly evolving, which means our training programs need to evolve too. It's all about continuous improvement. Wow, this 1984 paper has given us so much to think about. But it also makes you wonder, what will those groundbreaking training methods of tomorrow look like? What amazing discoveries will those future deep dives unearth decades from now? It's pretty exciting to think about, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, it's a good reminder that in the world of learning and development, just like in life, I think, the journey itself is just as important as the destination. I love that. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive. Thanks for joining us on this adventure. We explored a ton today, all with the goal of building a training program that not only works, but thrives. Until next time.